So without further ado, I want to introduce the presentation. It's nine elementary, my dear watershed. Watershed planning as an economic development tool. The presentation will be provided by Stephanie Dyer, Environmental Program Manager for Eastgate Regional Council of Governments, and Christina Zindarsik, Project Manager for Environmental Design Group. Stephanie has served 16 years as Eastgate's Environmental Program Manager and District 6 Liaison for the Clean Ohio Green Space Conservation Program. She manages the 208 plan for Mahoning and Trouble Counties and works closely with Ohio EPA to revitalize the Mahoning River and give regional technical assistance to surface drinking water providers and stormwater management agencies. Christina has been a project manager with Environmental Design Group for two years and spent eight years prior with Chagrin River Watershed Partners. She specializes in watershed planning, stormwater and ecological restoration projects, grant writing and administration, NPDES and other environmental regulations, GIS applications, and best use, best land use practices. Please welcome them both and thank you. Hey, good morning, everyone. I wanted to thank you, Matt, for that great introduction. And I believe I'm leading it off on the conversation. So um, please excuse the little blur on the lower left-hand corner of my camera. I'm having a um, display issue with the camera. So um, hope everything goes well. And I think you can see the um, presentation as it stands. So starting off today, we're talking about restoring the Mahoning River and just looking at it from an Eastgate perspective. And first and foremost, the Mahoning River is the river that flows into the Ohio River drainage basin. And it is one of the rivers in our valley that actually built this valley. So back in you know the early 1900s, we had steel mills aligning up and down the river from just outside of the city of Warren in Trumbull County all the way down to the village of Lowville in Mahoning County. So it was a pretty popular place, um, especially for those that were looking to uh, make some money in the steel industry. A little bit of background information about the watershed itself. So the Mahoning River um, drains about approximately 1,132 square miles, and it traverses through seven counties in Ohio. Um, when we're talking about restoring the Mahoning River, we're referring to the lower portion of the watershed, which starts at um, Levittsburg, which is just outside of the city of Warren in Warren Township, and flowing south, southeast to the Ohio PA, PA line. So from here, the um, the watershed is the restoring the watershed is where we are going to uh, look at this portion of the watershed only because of the fact that that's where the steel mills were and that's where the legacy pollutants lie. So here at Eastgate, we've taken the helm and we've taken the reins to go ahead and um, do this on our own on a local level using local funds and using Ohio EPA funding to restore our river. And it just made sense for Eastgate to take the reins because we're kind of the glue that puts all of our river communities together. And um, we share that same unique vision and interest, which is improving water quality within our two county region. So for the Mahoning River, it is a restoration that is larger than one entity. So it's something that Eastgate can't take on by itself, but rather we put the, the transformation in the hands of the local governments. So therefore we are kind of the wheel that gets things moving and planting the seed with the different river communities that have the authority to go ahead and um, restore the Mahoning River. So again, it does take a whole watershed to raise a river back into um, water quality standards with um, what the Ohio EPA wants to see. Currently, we are a warm, a designated warm water habitat river, and um, in many portions of it, including the sub-watersheds, we are in non-attainment of that. Um, 
So our path to restoring the river is one, removing the nine low head dams that are within the uh, Mahoning River. And many of those dams, based on the industrial needs that we had in the past, were used to pool water for the steel mill industry. So many times the water was pulled in, used to cool the, pro the steel products, and then it was put back out into the river at higher temperatures. And also with those heavy metals and PCBs that were you know, attached to, to the water as they were coming out of the um, processes. Um, another path is we wanna see a healthier ecosystem. So currently, according to the Ohio EPA's 2013 survey, our river is getting healthier on its no own, but what is preventing it from getting its larger jump and larger boost into um, attainment is many of those dam impoundments. Um, so that is one thing that we are focusing on, like I mentioned, are those nine dams to help um, supersede the attainment status of the Mahoning River. We want to see a healthier economy because as it stands, many of the communities have riverfront property. Um, they want to see um, some, of their, some of their visions is they, they want to see that turn around from just um, a corridor that has never been used due to whether it's brownfield issues or there's manufacturing along the river. But people have a vision to see something that is more recreational, that is more um, social economics for the communities, not just those along the river, but to draw from the suburbs into the cities and help revitalize them. And finally, we wanna see a safer river. Um, there have been a couple incidences, one more recently in May where um, a couple of people have decided to kayak the river, which you can, but um, because of lack of signage indicating where the dams are, uh, one person in particular in May had gotten caught up in the dam pool and was not able to exit and portage around the dam in time before being taken over the river. Fortunately, um, as far as I know right now, the person is um, hasn't, it ha has recovered from the incident, but um, most of the communities now want to see the river safer. So all three of those, the healthier ecosystem, economy, and a safer river will help accomplish our vision, which you see on the slide here. So some of the vision that uh, many of those communities in the background that you see, Warren, McDonald, Gerard, Youngstown, Camel Struthers, many of those have low head dams themselves. But it's not just restoring the ecosystem as much as it is restoring the economic vitality of each of those river communities. So with that comes new parks, new canoe, kayak liveries, restaurants, residential living, and wineries. We do have one winery that started up last year um, just in the city of Warren, right up adjacent to um, the river bank, and it provides such a great serene look of the river from an urbanized uh, area center such as the city of Warren. And I quoted Lowville Mayor Ducciani as um, one of our dam mayors who um, was kind of the catalyst of all of this. He was the first guinea pig to go ahead and look at removing the low head dam that is right outside um, of his community, rather inside his community in the Mahoning River. And his famous quote is, this whole thing with regards to restoring the river, this whole thing's gonna be a catalyst for us for development about, the, about his village. And that was about his village's dam removal project. So he has a big vision for a great little community, great little Italian community um, in Lowville. So, and that just stems from uh, the liveries and the restaurants and the residential living that he can see um, popping up along his river corridor community. But of course, it's always the question of how are we going to get there? So first and foremost, with Eastgate being the glue, we are moving ahead as a united movement. We've prided ourselves on moving ahead as a regional group, whether you know it's the mayor of the city of Warren way up in Trumbull County and the mayor of the city of Struthers in Mahoning County down towards the Ohio PA line. We've established this movement where whomever is going to get funding first, we're all going to support it because we know 
that at some point in time, what happens upstream will come downstream and it'll benefit us as far as the ecosystem is concerned and as far as startups are. So in order to do that, we started looking at the tools in our toolbox that we could use to get funding to go ahead and start removing low head dams. And part of those tools, um, one of the items Christina will talk about here shortly, is the non-point source implementation strategy plan. And those are formerly those are the new watershed action plans. So if we take those plans <clears throat> where it characterizes the water quality within our community and creates kind of a shopping list of items that our each community can do to help improve water quality, we can take those items that are written within that plan, take it off the shopping list and put it into a WRRSP uh, program um, application. So with that, by identifying the plan, we are somewhat afforded a bump in scoring because we are taking a plan and actually utilizing it to, or implementing it to improve water quality within our region. And many of the non-point source plans that we do have, um, we are using it to create an overall corridor revitalization plan. So our motivation, we had some motivation in the beginning. Um, this whole restoration program, or the idea of it rather, began back in the early 1990s under an Army Corps, US Army Corps of Engineers study. And about 13 years after the whole um, reconnaissance study and feasibility study had come to fruition, um, mind you, the feasibility study is still in draft form. Um, it had taken so many years to find out that the project that we wanted to do, which was the ecological restoration of the river, which included dredging the entire river, and we were hoping to get dam removal um, implemented within that plan as well. We found that 13 years later, it was dead on arrival because there had been some uh, disagreements between the Pittsburgh headquarters uh, the district office and headquarters with regards to whether or not the Army Corps, under the WERDA Act that initiated um, the ecological study, would permit the Army Corps to go in and dredge the, the sediment, as well as go in and even remove the dams. So with that being said, um, Ohio EPA, um, specifically John Qualick at the time, had told us that we could do this on a local level and we could use the funding through the Ohio EPA like folks up in Cuyahoga Falls were doing with along, along the Cuyahoga River. So the motivation um, for us was simply the Clean Water Act. We wanna see um, our river return back to its attainment status to an extent that you know, we start to see the fish species and the diversity come back. Um, and for those who are the implementers, it's the funding and the business startups. So the, if the funding is there to help them remove these dams, then we can start to see the business starting up along the river. And those are the businesses that actually, you know, do appreciate the aesthetics of um, building up, not up to, but building near a free flowing river. Uh, again, as I mentioned, another motivation is the public, public safety aspect of it. So the public safety, of course, we understand that the dams present uh, these dangers. We realize that they're not inspected. And at some point in time, because of their lifespan that they've had since when they were built back in the early 1900s, we've realized that mother nature could take care of these on their own at any point in time. So looking to do that on our own um, would be a more responsible uh, way of restoring the river. One of the things, like I had mentioned, we started this on a regional level, but it also expanded into gathering all the crafters together. I like to call them crafters because we've, we've worked together to um, create this coalition that has really surpassed uh, my expectations as far as who all is involved. Um, of course, we have um, partnerships through the Mahoning River Mayors Association. Um, a lot of those mayors in the association are dam mayors. 
So they are within a community that um, has a dam. They may not own the dam yet, but um, they are looking to uh, remove the dams when they can, if they can. We have state and federal leaders at the time. Um, Director Butler from the Ohio EPA was uh, full speed ahead with promoting our Mahoning River and the projects that we are doing and was very impressed by the, the regional aspect and the regional togetherness that we shared. Um, and even uh, today's director, Lori Stevenson, has um, taken over and continues those footsteps forward with our, with our river community. We have our Youngstown Port Authority, Youngstown Warren Port Authority on board and our interest groups. We include um, the business leaders. So the Youngstown Warren Regional Chamber of Commerce and uh, Mr. Sam Cavelli is, has been a huge uh, proponent of removing dams and um, he's you know, supported our, our acts in hope of maybe one day putting up one of his restaurants along the river. So the non-point source implementation strategy plan really is a plan for everything non-point source. So they're created with one goal and it's to leverage funds for dam removal and that is specific to our region. We had two plans that Christina, um, that we contracted with Environmental Design Group to create for Eastgate with regards to two upper um, Mahoning River subwatersheds that actually had dams in them, in their reaches. So Christina wrote our plans beautifully and two of the action items are actually removing the low head dams. Um, additional items to be added are, as our conversations continue would include any other type of um, project that would uh, lower non-point source pollutant or nutrient loads into our local stream. So once we have those plans done, we're able to go ahead and apply for state grants to, to help um, fund those dam removal projects. And one of them right now um, was being is under the WRRSP nomination period. It was just submitted and it is the Summit Street Dam located in the city of Warren. And that was one of the plans um, that included that dam. Christina wrote one of the plans that included that dam. So you can bet that that project and that non-point source implementation strategy plan was included in the application. So. The plans help us work from the inside out. They focus on restoring the river. They also focus on not only do you have a dam removal project, but you also have a stream restoration project. And whether that's in stream or restoring the banks, it all takes place within that one project written in with written in the non-point source and the implementation strategy plan. It's quite a tongue twister when you start saying it too fast and too often. So these are some of the activities that we're currently working on right now. And this lower picture right here in the lower left-hand corner is the actual low head dam in um, Lowville. These are the piers that have now been taken out. And so probably at this time right now, they're working on taking out the dam itself. The non-point source implementation plan is a living document. It is something that is always a work in progress because as you take on one implementation item and you resolve it, you make room for more. So whether or not you are ready to implement the plan or not, you can, you know, time is at your hands. So for us, it's just the beginning. We realize that we could add to it, we can subtract from it, and it gets our conversations here at Eastgate started. So we're able to talk to our member communities who want to resolve water quality issues and tell them, hey, we might have a plan for that. And it's also good because we can share information. So what one community is doing up in Lowville, that information can be shared with the communities that are up in, you know, towards the city of Warren who are just beginning the dam removal process. And of course, finally, just to bring to attention that no good deed goes without speed bumps. So for us here in the Valley, we do have two dam pools that are currently being utilized by um, up and running steel mills. 
so those are something that we are working in our comprehensive plan to find out, you know, uh, through the HECRAT studies, whether or not we remove a dam, what it will look like after dam removal, and how it may or may not impact uh, these steel mill communities. So some of their issues would be their intake, where their level of intake is at versus after dam removal, how low the water level will be. So for them, that would include upgrading their intake infrastructure to accommodate for that drop in uh, river elevation. We do have some Riverside residents who are not happy with um, removing dams. So just north of Lowville, or not Lowville, I'm sorry, Levittsburg, there's the dam pool that people truly, truly love and embrace, and they use it for their boating. We've seen pontoon boats. Um, there's septic systems that discharge into the river. So those are some of their concerns, whether or not the river, if that Levittsburg Dam is removed, and mind you, the dam is owned by the Trumbull County Metro Parks. If that dam is removed, will that river turn into a trickle? Will they lose their wildlife, such as river otters, the herons, the eagles, and their, their fish? They don't seem to understand um, how the river without a dam will actually improve water quality and improve the diversity and the um, health and wellness of their favorite things, such as the fish that they like and the wildlife. So it's a huge education um, speed bump that we have, that we are continuing to, to implement and just trying to get through some of those public misconceptions. And so with that, I will turn it over to Christina, who is ready to talk more about those non-point source plans. Okay, and let me turn on my video. There we go. All right. Thank you, Stephanie, for that wonderful uh, that wonderful talk. I just want to, you know, before I get going, I I really liked working. First of all, I really liked working with you, and uh, and it was really great putting those plans together. And I feel like that this story resonates so well within the One Planet framework because it's a really great story about how we're all thinking about ourselves, but as neighbors on this One Planet and working together as residents of One Planet in a collaborative way to access and distribute uh, resources for the benefit of all. Um, and so with that, I am going to pull up uh, and... Let me see if I can get my screen shared. Okay. All right, hopefully you guys should be seeing that by now. Um, so hopefully Stephanie has wetted your whistle a little bit to learn a little bit more about watershed plans. Uh, I've done quite a bit of them in my day. I am really excited to talk to you guys about this because this is honestly one of my favorite things to do, um, how they can be useful for you. Um, but before we get started, I want everybody to kind of like take a break, sit a little bit, maybe move their heads a little bit. Um, I wear a lot of different hats in my career, and one of them is also a passion for making sure that green infrastructure works. So I have gone out and done a lot of operations and maintenance inspection on green infrastructure, including bioretention. And I see things while I'm in the bioretention or around the bioretention. And I have uh, a little icebreaker for you and you can use your chat box if you can access that to make guesses. Um, I actually can't see your guesses, but it might be fun just to show them off for everybody else uh, what your guesses would be um, as to which of these things have I not found in bioretention. So we have a webby friend having a snack, a very good dog. I have no idea what was going on in, in that picture and see uh, cash money, always nice, uh, a marble or perhaps an infinity stone, and Plasticus crocus, the North American litter frog. So if anybody wants to hazard some guesses, um, I think I see some things popping up in the chat. Ah, okay, all right. I can see the numbers of things flying into the chat, but I can't actually see the chat right now without uh, messing up my window. So I'm just going to leave it be. I think we see some guesses. I'm going to let it be open for just a little bit more. Okay. Okay. 
So if you're curious, the answer is actually E, the marble slash infinity stone. I did not find that in the bioretention. I found it adjacent to the bioretention, but it was definitely close to the bioretention. Um, the very good dog was actually in the bioretention. However, they were a very good dog and they did not damage the bioretention. They were just kind of hanging out and got a little close. Um, but yeah, so thank you for playing. And, uh, and now we can continue. So I'm gonna give you all uh, just a brief um, overview of the watershed planning process, watershed planning in Ohio. So at its most basic, watershed management. It's uh, you study the relevant characteristics of a watershed with the ultimate goal, as I said before, to distribute resources and also plan your programs and your projects to sustain and enhance vital watershed functions for all communities. So thinking about it from a more holistic perspective, people, plants, and animals. Um, in the state of Ohio, we actually have a very robust watershed planning program that's been around for a really long time, uh, since before I got started. So yeah, a decent amount of time. Um, and then the, uh, the first types of watershed plans were called watershed action plans. And they were initially developed on a larger, larger watershed scale. So think about like a watershed action plan was developed for say the entire Cuyahoga River or uh, the Black River. I was um, one of the original Black River watershed coordinators. So I know all about the Black River watershed, uh, watershed action plan. Um, or for the Chagrin River, for example. So, or the Grand. So like that larger watershed unit. Um, and then, so they, they produce large scale planning efforts and recommendations. And a watershed action plan could talk about just about anything. Water supply, water quality, drainage, stormwater runoff, water right zoning, uh, point source in addition to non-point source pollution, you name it, there was a way to get it into a watershed action plan if it had anything to do with water or water resources in a watershed area. So they got pretty big, they got pretty unwieldy. Um, they are intended to address what are called the nine essential elements, which is brought down from US EPA. And these are key elements identified at the federal level, critical for achieving improvements in water quality. Um, if you're curious about what the nine elements are, they're actually right there on the left side of my screen. I am not going to spend the time reading them all for you, um, but rest assured there are nine of them. I numbered them and some of them seem pretty low key and some of them you might be like, wow, what is that? Okay, so we're gonna go through that in a little bit. Um, now, these nine elements were addressed in these watershed action plans, but unfortunately, they were not addressed at the level of specificity that US EPA now desires. So most watershed action plans do address the nine essential elements essentially or generally, but not at a project specific level. So individual projects must address nine elements in that specific project framework, meaning that most of these watershed action plans that have already been developed are not fully nine element compatible. Um, they also feel that the watershed, uh, the watershed action plan as it was initially developed is too broad. So they want them to be pulled back. So the largest watershed unit that a nine element compatible plan can address is a sub watershed of the greater watershed area. So I'll use an example that I know very well is the Chagrin watershed. The Chagrin watershed is broken up into seven smaller sub watershed units. And each one of those sub watershed units can have, should have its own nine element plan. So for the greater chagrin watershed, there will now be seven nine element plans. So there's a lot to do folks, so let's get going. So um, first of all, I'd like you to meet my work from home coworker. Her name is Ekaterina and she is all business, just like I am when I talk about watershed based planning. Um, so the goals of these nine element non-point source implementation strategic plans, Stephanie wasn't kidding, it can be a mouthful. Uh, I call them NIPSIS. So if you hear me ever say NIPSIS, that's what I'm talking about. Um, the goals are to eliminate the water quality impairments in a watershed area, restore impaired waters that aren't meeting attainment of water quality standards, and to reduce and prevent non-point source pollution. So that last bit is very important. So these plans are designed non-point source implementation to directly address non-point source pollution versus point source pollution. Uh, the plan is supposed to follow a format of critical areas. So within that sub watershed unit, you identify specific zones or areas or locations, and then develop identified goals and quantifiable, quantifiable is very important, objectives to achieve those goals. And I'll go into what that might look like in a little bit. Um, the reason why these plans are developed in, in this particular manner following this particular format is that that is an easy way to assure non-point source specific grant funders such as US EPA or Ohio EPA that a proposed water quality project meets those nine federally required eligibility elements. So it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of uh, uh, effort out of that in that it streamlines the process considerably and, uh, and helps grant funding get to where it needs to be quicker. 
So in the state of Ohio, Ohio EPA administers the NPSIS development process. They do the review and they do the approval. US EPA will come in every once in a while and perform an audit on the approved plans to ensure that they are still meeting the nine element requirements and that Ohio EPA is doing a good job. But there hasn't been any speed bumps so far and Ohio EPA has been doing, in my opinion, a very good job of administering this, this process. There are current guidance templates and an interactive map that I'll get into uh, at that web link that I'm not going to read, or you could just do what I do and Google Ohio EPA NPSIS and it pops right up. So there is guidance in place, um, and we will talk about that at the end of my talk. So in terms of putting one of these things together, what types of things do you need to have to put one of these together? Um, you want to use, this, they stress that you want to use existing water quality documentation. So Ohio EPA and others have put forth a lot of documentation, monitoring, information on watershed units already. And a lot of that you can then glean basically everything you need to know to be able to construct one of these plans. Um, things like total maximum daily load documents, water quality monitoring for attainment by Ohio EPA, um, biological technical support documents, otherwise known as TSDs, um, integrated assessment reporting, which is a every two years um, assessment of Ohio's water bodies and how they stand in rank in attainment. Um, and that is all published by Ohio EPA. And so you can go on their website and you can go in there and you can look at these specific documents and you can ascertain the thing that they wanna know is the causes and sources of impairment specific to each watershed areas. So common causes are things like siltation, nutrients, habitat, alteration flow, uh, E. coli, sometimes you'll see that uh, described as fecal coliform or bacteria in older documents, temperature, pesticides, algae, et cetera, any kind of non-point source pollutant. Um, so, and then sources are urban stormwater, riparian habitat loss, channelization, agriculture, acid mine drainage, um, failed HSTSs or home sewage treatment systems, uh, dams or impoundments as Stephanie described earlier, and things like combined sewers. Now, in terms of thinking about that, I like to think of it as causes are the bad stuff. So what's the bad stuff? Siltation, nutrients, habitat alteration. And then sources are where the bad stuff comes from. So what's, what's making the bad stuff, which is riparian habitat loss, channelization, acid mine drainage, et cetera. So that's a good way to kind of think about it. The bad stuff versus where the bad stuff comes from. Um, you then identify critical areas based on these causes and sources for project implementation. So the goal here is to look at these, co these causes and sources and see what they are and what's causing them. And then looking at areas specific in that watershed unit that you're, you're putting this plan together for and where would you need to physically address those issues. So with critical areas, they can get a little confusing. Um, you, when you think of critical area, you tend to think of, as I used to, it has to be like a geographic area, a specific geographical area. Like, you know, I draw a circle around this area, that's my critical area. And it can be like that, but they want you to kind of think about it in a different way. You, they want it to be thought of more as a critical issue rather than a critical area, because they want you to look at specifically what that cause or that source is. So if your cause is nutrient pollution, for example, where do you need to address nutrient pollution? It may not necessarily be in just one location. It may be throughout that watershed unit, there are areas. And so you would pull all of that into your critical area and you would identify those as your critical areas to specifically address nutrients. So you could say develop a critical area showing locations to address excess siltation, but don't develop a critical area that just follows your community's boundaries and then say, well, I'm gonna address all the water quality problems in that area. They want it to be very specific to a specific cause rather than a jumble of different causes. There can be overlap in critical areas. Um, so that's not unheard of. You can't, you don't have to just have it be for nutrients. And if, and if, and if there's also siltation happening, it can't, it can't met, go into that, that critical area. You can address, there can be, it's a Venn diagram type of concept. They can't overlap. Um, so within each critical area, you then develop goals and objectives to quantify and track progress towards attainment. So in the state of Ohio, your goals will largely be based on the attainment of your water body that you're looking at. And in Ohio, we use what are called biocriteria. So that is fish scores, macroinvertebrate scores, habitat scores, how well your fish communities are doing, how well your macroinvertebrate communities are doing, aka bugs, um, 
and how the river or, or water body's habitat is. Is that habitat capable of supporting fish and bugs? So that's what we use to determine attainment in many places, in places like the Western Basin and other areas where nutrient loading is a big concern. I know that nitrogen loading is uh, to the Gulf in the Ohio River watershed is also a concern. Um, you can also use things like nutrient load reductions if you have established nutrient load reduction requirements or, or things work towards that. Um, so those are your goals. So specifically, your goal is basically going to be, we want to reach attainment in this water body. These are the scores we need to reach attainment. Your objectives, though, your objectives are where you get to get creative. Your objectives are, again, quantifiable, but they are metrics that you can develop after looking through your research to achieve those stated goals. So an objective may be restoring 1,000 linear feet of eroding stream or implementing agricultural BMPs to treat 200 acres of farmland. So these measurable, quantifiable metrics to take you closer to attainment. And so then you've developed these objectives. Well, now you need to have projects that can implement those objectives. So you're developing projects now within, again, each critical area to progress towards completing those objectives and achieving your goals. You don't necessarily, if you have an objective that says, I'm gonna restore a thousand linear feet of stream, you don't necessarily then have to find a project that restores a thousand linear feet of stream. You can cobble it together from different projects as long as they're all in that same critical area and they're all advancing your goal towards that, that full attainment. So for example, a 200 linear foot stream restoration is estimated to reduce the sediment loading by two tons per year, achieve 20% of the identified 1,000 linear foot objective, and improve the qualitative habitat evaluation index, which is the, the habitat score, from a 48 to the goal of 55 in the critical area that we've designed to address siltation. Um, and then what you're going to do is you take all of that information, you can distill it down into a project table, which just shows an overview of critical areas and identified projects for each critical area. And then from that project table, you pull that out and you further develop those projects into what are called project summary sheets, which is a more detailed description that specifically follows that nine element framework that I talked about earlier. It individually addresses all nine elements and that's what helps keep your plan nine element compatible. So at that point, once you have at least one critical area, currently you need at least one critical area for your plan and you need at least one project summary sheet for your critical area in order for it to be submitted for Ohio EPA for review and approval. Then you go through the review process. They may come back with comments. Uh, they will always work with you. I have worked with Ohio EPA and Ohio Department of Agriculture on numerous um, non-point non source plans and they have always been great to work with. Um, and then so once approved, yes, you have a plan now, but as Stephanie said, these plans are living documents. They can be and absolutely should be updated and resubmitted as we go and we find new critical areas, revised critical areas, new projects, updated objectives. These are for you know, an, a regular look at what's going on in your watershed and how best you can do things within that framework to be able to access funding for those projects. So I just threw a lot at y'all. So I distilled it down. NPSIS in a nutshell, or a smart art chart, as this happens to be. So at your biggest picture in an, in an NPSIS plan, you're going to be doing your general overview of your watershed. You're going to be talking about geology, soils, the biology of the, of the water, the land use and land cover, streams and rivers, like how many tributaries are in this area, how does the drainage network look. And you'd be looking at that on the grander scale. So say like um, the Chagrin watershed. So that's, you'd be looking at it at that large watershed scale, the Chagrin watershed, brief overview of the Chagrin. Then you would go down, you'd go down a step. You would then look at that, that hydrologic unit code 12 or the HUC 12, which is that sub watershed unit I talked about, which is the single largest unit you can develop an individual plan for. You're gonna provide a detailed description of that specific watershed area using the previously uh, um, accessed information that you can get from like Ohio EPA who have already done descriptions of these and who have already done research on these. Um, you then look at that, you include stuff like the soils there, the biology there, the land use and land cover there. Um, so all of the above that you talked about in part one, but now you're looking at also those causes and sources that are happening within that up 12 unit. You look at the water quality data that has been, that has been monitored, that monitoring has shown in that area. You look at previous studies that pertain to that specific unit, and you can include that in that chapter. And then from that, you take a step down again and get and drill down deeper. Now you're looking at where are your critical areas based on those previous causes and sources. What critical areas are you looking at in the watershed? Where are your problems? 
where do you need to solve them? Developing that, looking at the water quality data there, using that to develop your goals and objectives for attainment within those specific areas for the larger HUB-12 unit. So basically you're kind of identifying your hot zones and what exactly you need to do in those hot zones to make the entire watershed better. And then you move down and now you're talking about it at the implementation level, the actual implementation level, where you're taking those goals and objectives and you're translating them into actual implementable projects. You're developing your project table and your project summary sheets. So, Hopefully you all are totally pumped about this and you are, but you're also kind of wondering, so what does all this still do for me? Why would you want to do one of these? These are, as Stephanie mentioned, these are a great targeted, fundable, science-based approach to water quality improvement. Um, the ultimate goals of these plans is to help Ohio advance towards attainment of all of its streams and waterways, um, but they offer this added opportunity of accessing funds for water quality projects that could have other benefits things like reducing localized flooding problems, improving aesthetics of a community, and also, as Stephanie mentioned, sustainably complementing economic development goals. So as we think about our role on this one planet, we think about ways to be A, more flexible in finding ways to fund projects, and B, thinking about building resiliency into our neighborhoods and working together and collaboratively, collaboratively in a watershed management framework uh, to drive economic development, and build that kind of that long lasting resiliency into our neighborhoods. Um, these plans are specifically required for applying for Ohio EPA Section 319 grant funds. You absolutely need to have, in order to access these funds, an approved nine element plan, and the project has to be approved in that plan. So that is, that is a straight up requirement. As Stephanie mentioned, it can also net you points, bonus points on other types of funding sources as well. Um, including the US EPA's Great Lakes Restoration Initiative grant funding, uh, if you are in the Lake Erie watershed, or as she mentioned, the WRSP program also looks favorably on projects that are included in one of these plans. And if you're wondering about the different types of projects that can be included in these plans, that's in that blue box down there. So you look at some of these projects, stream and wetland riparian restoration, bioengineered stream bank stabilization, dam removals, as Stephanie talked about, nutrient sediment reduction, more of an agricultural best management practice, uh, inland public lake restoration, and also green stormwater infrastructure, um, which that could be uh, bioretention, permeable pavements, green roofing, things like that. So actually looking at your communities, your built environment, and looking at ways to creatively retrofit those areas to better manage stormwater and potentially help solve issues, and also could potentially be an aesthetic improvement. So what are some examples of some projects? Um, so I'm gonna give you two examples, of projects that I've worked on personally uh, that have used funding that was leveraged in, that was supported by types of plans like this. Um, so this one is Great Lakes Mall Stormwater Retrofits. This is out in Mentor, Ohio. Um, this was funded through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. And um, this is a really cool project. So the Great Lakes Mall, I don't know if you're familiar with Mentor, but the Great Lakes Mall covers about 11, it represents about 11% of the impervious surface in that subwatershed drainage area. That's a lot. And a lot of that mall, practically all of it, um, did not have any real post-construction stormwater management. Um, so a lot of it went in before that. Uh, so looking at that, it's a prime opportunity for retrofitting and helping attenuate uh, base flow conditions. And, and, and storm flow conditions. So we were looking at this from a perspective of not just water quality improvements, but in partnering with the folks that own the mall property uh, at the time, uh, they were looking at kind of giving their mall a facelift. So they were already thinking about doing some renovation work on the frontage right here at the main food court entrance. And we said, well, while you're thinking about doing that, why don't we try to access some funds to do some really cool stuff in here that will also help improve the way the mall looks. So unfortunately, I don't have a before photo of this mall, but this is the after photo. And you can see there's a beautiful permeable paver. So that lighter area there is all permeable pavers um, in front. And then you can see uh, some tree pits over to the right, which are not full bioretention, but more like fancy engineered rain gardens. But you can see the curb cuts that are taking some of that stormwater runoff off of the uh, off of the parking lot. And when they redid that portion of the parking lot, we kind of 
re redid the grading there to allow for stormwater to flow better into those tree areas and then onto the permeable pavers. Underneath the permeable pavers, um, there's a lot of work happening down there. Uh, it's really exciting. Yeah, baby. We managed to grab water off the roof too, and we sent it down to these uh, underground infiltration chambers. So that's me down below with those actual underground infiltration chambers uh, as they were being installed. I call that a stormwater selfie. I take them all the time because I'm a huge nerd. So that was a great project. And then we're going to move into this is, uh, so before I get going, I really do believe that Drake is a big fan of stream and wetland restoration. I, you know, his latest music video clearly shows him enjoying himself in a water-based environment. And I feel like he's, he could be a potential powerful advocate for clean water uh, and water quality improvements. So this was the before shot. This is Hawthorne Creek restoration that I worked on out in Solon. Uh, and this was funded through Section 319 grant funding so what you're looking at here is um, from the front of the photo is the foreground is upstream flowing downstream. And there's a part here where it has been completely blown out and scoured out. Uh, it is not supposed to look like that. I just want to be clear. Um, and then the other great thing or well, not great thing is, is that along that ridge there is actually a sewer line. Uh, so there was some sewer infrastructure being threatened by this, by this erosion. So not only is this a massive, so sediment was um, identified as a really bad pollutant issue in this particular watershed. So not only is this heavily contributing to sediment loads in this area, um, it's also threatening infrastructure. So this was a great opportunity to access some funding to again, you have to, to take care of the infrastructure, but why not also build natural resiliency into the system while you can do it? So yeah, that's right, Drake. This is, this is really great. So this is the after shot. Um, did some rock toe protection, built back out that floodplain bench to allow for more floodplain storage and dissipate some of that erosive energy of the water as it comes downstream, planted it up with native vegetation. And this is about, I want to say, two years out from that restoration. Um, and as you can see, it looks great. And um, this is actually an older shot. It's been around now for a couple more years after that, and it's only getting better with age. And so that's one of the really nice things about these systems is that if you use this funding, you identify it from a water quality perspective and a natural resource perspective, you're building and you're creating projects that essentially in, in, a, in an ideal way, kind of just maintain themselves and only get better as they age. Which, how many times can you say that about infrastructure? So now probably you're really excited and you want to do one of these, these plans and you really, 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 but you're not sure, do I already have one? Um, because there have been some plans implemented in the state of Ohio. So do you have one already? Well, as my friend Rick Wilson, who helps run the Ohio EPA non-point source and section 319 program, there's a map for that. So Ohio EPA has really upped their game on their GIS based uh, systems and they've developed this great interactive watershed map that you can access. Um, and that shows you where all the established and approved non-point source plans currently are in the state of Ohio. And you can go and you can click on it and it will take you to this little pop-up and you can view that document and you can easily see everything there currently is in that non-point source plan and whether or not you might need to add something to it. So here's a greater map of Ohio showing all the plan areas that have already been implemented. So you can see that in these orange zones here, these are the non-point source nine element plans. So these are the NIPSIS plans that have already been developed. Uh, up here in green, these ones are coded green because they also deal with out of state watershed drainage. So those are coded in a special way. And then these blue ones down here are acid mine drainage or AMDAT plans. So those were grandfathered in um, uh, when this watershed planning process kind of got switched to the nine element because they were already basically nine element compatible. So those are AMDAT and acid mine plans. And then these orange ones are the non-point source implementation strategy plans. So you can see that while we've made great progress in certain areas and you can tell where the priority zones have been in the past in terms of being able to do watershed planning, um, there's still a lot of ground left to cover out here. And you can see the two right here over in the Mahoning. Those were the ones Stephanie and I worked on. Um, so, you know, hey, if you don't see a plan in your zone, you could be next. Give me a call. We'll talk. So I talked earlier about this guidance being available, but, um, you know, it's still there. And I want to stress that it is still considered the current guidance. 
However, Ohio EPA and Ohio Department of Agriculture and a working group comprised of yours truly and a couple of other all day suckers who love watershed planning are creating new guidance for the NPSIS planning process. Um, the goal is, is to have this guidance be finalized before the end of 2020. And we've been addressing some of the frequently asked questions that have been cropping up as we produce these plans and put them together. And also as we hear other people while we're going through this watershed planning process. So some of the frequently asked questions that have come up are things like, what if I'm trying to put one of these together and I'm looking for data and my published water quality data is so old that it's basically outside credible data range or there's, there's no good recent stuff. How do we deal with that? That's a good question. And that's something that we need to work on providing more clear guidance on. Um, the critical area stuff, I talked a little bit about it, but I'm sure that some of you are still probably like, yeah, no, I don't get what she just said. Um, so providing stronger clarity on the critical area development. What actually is an acceptable critical area versus what isn't? And I can tell you that um, as I've moved through the watershed planning process, basically from start to finish, um, the idea of what constitutes a proper critical area has changed. And that plans that I used, that I put out very early on probably have critical areas in them right now that Ohio EPA would not approve at this point. That's not to say that it was bad or wrong that they were done that way. It's just that the, the idea of what constitutes a proper critical area has now shifted. And so staying on top of that and providing that guidance. So if you are looking at previous watershed plans for guidance, I would caution against going back to old plans and just go with what the most recent plans are saying because that should be considered uh, the most proper go by at this current point. Um, and then another big one that we're starting to see now that we actually have a lot of approved plans coming into the state of Ohio, how do I make updates to an approved plan if I'm not the original author? There's actually no guidance currently to address that, and it's been taken care of on a piece-by-piece uh, -piece basis, on a plan-by-plan -plan basis, uh, with guidance from Ohio EPA and Ohio Department of Agriculture, usually just giving them a call and saying, hey, I need some guidance on this. Um, so being more clear about that and actually putting that in some established guidance is something that we're hoping to do. So I will be here for the panel and I will be happy to answer any questions you have now and then. Um, if you did want to reach out to me, if you've ruminated on this by the end of the week and you came up with something, you're like, oh, snap, I wanted to ask her this thing. There's my email. Feel free to use it. I love talking about watershed planning. So thank you.